Hello, this is Don Piper. I have often been asked, why did you take so long to write 90 Minutes in Heaven, a true story of death and life? Before the incredible response to the book, I frequently replied, it just took a long time for me to become comfortable with sharing such a painful, intimate story. Over a year after the book's release, with over a half million copies in print, I would add today, and because God was preparing me to bring real hope to hurting hearts. Many who had a part in ministering to me during my long recovery are now in the presence of the Lord themselves. It has been my privilege to conduct funeral services for some of them. The beat of my heart quickens when I think of seeing them at Heaven's Gate. But since this book's release, from Stockholm to San Francisco, I have met hundreds of thousands of new souls with whom I will spend eternity. My children, so young and fragile when their dad was killed in the car wreck, are now delightful, productive young adults. It has been my great joy to attend their high school and college graduation exercises. I even walked my daughter Nicole down the aisle and performed her wedding. My wife Eva and I are so proud of each of them. Eva, who endured so much during my ordeal, is on the threshold of her retirement from teaching school. We have now been married as many years since the accident as before it, a total of 32. I pray that God will use this audio book to bless you. It is a book of hope, yet it is also my unvarnished look at someone who took desperation and turned it into a divine aspiration, who took abject disappointment and turned it into divine appointments and took an awful mess and turned it into a message. You are about to hear that message now. May God use it to give you hope, today and forever. Ninety Minutes in Heaven, A True Story of Death and Life Don Piper with Cecil Murphy This book is dedicated to The Prayer Warriors, you prayed, I'm here. Acknowledgements I wrote this book in self-defense. In the years since 1989, I have seldom satisfied anyone with quick answers or brief encounters retelling my experiences. On radio, on TV, in newspapers, and from countless pulpits and other speaking engagements, I have generally left more unanswered questions than satisfactory responses. People consistently have wanted to know more, always more. I wrote three different manuscripts about this experience to satisfy inquiring minds. None of them satisfied me. That's when I prevailed upon one of America's distinguished authors to partner with me to write a book about the most compelling issues concerning my death and life. Cecil Murphy author of very successful biographies of such luminaries as Franklin Graham, Truett Cathy, B.J. Thomas, Dino Carsonakis, and Dr. Ben Carson, gave me the perspective I wanted to write the book I needed to write. You're holding it now. Cease has become a devoted friend, confidant, and mentor. Indeed, one of the blessings of writing this book has been to know Cease Murphy. His passion for this project is felt on every page. Thank you, Cease. You are deeply appreciated. Likewise, the Knight Agency's Deidre Knight's belief in this project is much appreciated. And Dr. Vicki Crumpton of Baker Publishing Group is a person I have grown to admire. Her dedication to seeing this story in print is cherished. I want to thank the staff of both Memorial Hermann Medical Center's Trauma Unit and St. Luke's Episcopal Hospital in Houston for their devotion to the healing arts. Special thanks to Dr. Thomas Greider, my orthopedic surgeon, since that fateful night of January 18, 1989. Precious people of God from many churches have allowed me to serve them. Not only were their prayers crucial to my survival, but their presence has been a blessing to my ministry. 
deep gratitude goes to South Park Baptist Church of Alvin, Texas, God's Great Prayer Warriors. I would like to acknowledge the special contributions of First Baptist Church, Airline Baptist Church, and Marksdale Baptist Church, all of Bossier City, Louisiana. My father in the ministry, Dr. Damon V. Vaughn, former pastor of the first two of those churches, is owed an immeasurable debt. For standing faithfully with me in the days since my accident, I express undying love for the First Baptist Church of Rochere in Texas, along with Hunter's Glen and Murphy Road Baptist Church of Plano, Texas. Since 1996, I have called First Baptist Church of Pasadena, Texas, my place of service. Your support for this project has been sweet and unwavering. Thank you all for your patience, forbearance, prayers, and love. To Anita Onorecker and her late husband, Dick, thank you for allowing God to use you so dramatically. To all my friends, brothers, and sisters in Christ who prayed so passionately, I thank you. Only God knows your sacrifices and kindnesses. Most of all, I thank my friends of many years, Cliff McCardle and David Gentiles, true gifts from God. Whether day or night, convenient or imposition, expedient or sacrificial, you have always been faithful. And thank you all for encouraging me to see this book to fruition. Finally, I want to express my profound gratitude to my wife's parents, Eldon and Ethel Pentecost, and my own parents, Ralph and Billy Piper, for their incalculable sacrifices and faithful support to my three children, Nicole, Chris, and Joe. I say, God has given me children so much better than I could have ever deserved. I am highly blessed. How can I say thank you for all that you've meant to me, even more since that Wednesday so long ago? And to my wife of 30 years, Eva, no one should ever have to do the things you had to do for me, but you did them, faithfully, compassionately, and without hesitation. Of all my family and friends, only Eva comes closest to really knowing how painful this journey has been each day, for she has endured it with me. Eva, you are a gift from God. Lord, you know I haven't always understood the whys of what happened, but I never stop trusting you. I pray, Abba Father, that this humble effort to tell my story pleases you and blesses many. Amen. Don Piper, February 2004 Prologue I died on January 18, 1989. Paramedics reached the scene of the accident within minutes. They found no pulse and declared me dead. They covered me with a tarp so that onlookers wouldn't stare at me while they attended to the injuries of the others. I was completely unaware of the paramedics or anyone else around me. Immediately after I died, I went straight to heaven. While I was in heaven, a Baptist preacher came upon the accident scene. Even though he knew I was dead, he rushed to my lifeless body and prayed for me. Despite the scoffing of the emergency medical technicians, EMTs, he refused to stop praying. At least ninety minutes after the EMTs pronounced me dead, God answered that man's prayers. I return to earth. This is my story. Chapter 1. The Accident Hebrews 13.6 This is why we can say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, so I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Hebrews 13.6 the Baptist General Convention of Texas, BGCT, holds annual statewide conferences. 
In January 1989, they chose the north shore of Lake Livingston, where the Union Baptist Association, composed of all Baptist churches in the greater Houston area, operates a large conference center called Trinity Pines. The conference focused on church growth, and I went because I was seriously considering starting a new church. The conference started on Monday and was scheduled to end with lunch on Wednesday. On Tuesday night, I joined a BGCT executive and friend named J.V. Thomas for a long walk. J.V. had become a walker after his heart attack, so we exercised together the last night of the conference. Months earlier, I had begun thinking that it was time for me to start a new congregation. Before embarking on such a venture, I wanted as much information as I could get. I knew that J.V. had as much experience and knowledge about new church development as anyone in the BGCT. Because he had started many successful churches in the state, most of us recognized him as the expert. As we walked together that night, we talked about my starting a new church, when to do it, where to plan it. I wanted to know the hardships as well as the pitfalls to avoid. He answered my seemingly endless questions and raised some issues I hadn't thought about. We walked and talked for about an hour. Despite the cold, rainy weather, we had a wonderful time together. J.V. remembers that time well. So do I. But for a different reason. It would be the last time I would ever walk normally. On Wednesday morning, the weather worsened. A steady rain fell. Had the temperature been only a few degrees cooler, we couldn't have traveled because everything would have been frozen. The morning's meeting started on time. The final speaker did something Baptist preachers almost never do. He finished early. Instead of lunch, the staff at Trinity Pine served us brunch at about 10.30. I had packed the night before, so everything was stowed in my red 1986 Ford Escort. As soon as we finished brunch, I said goodbye to all my friends and got into my car to drive back to the church where I was on staff, South Park Baptist Church of Alvin, a Houston bedroom community. When I started the engine, I remembered that only three weeks earlier I had received a traffic ticket for not wearing a seat belt. I had been on my way to preach for a pastor friend who was going to have throat surgery. A Texas trooper had caught me. That ticket still lay on the passenger seat reminding me to pay it as soon as I returned to Alvin. Until I received the ticket, I had not usually worn a seat belt. But after that, I changed my ways. When I looked at that ticket, I thought, I don't want to be stopped again. So I carefully fastened my seat belt. That small act would be a crucial decision. There are two ways to get back to Houston and on to Alvin. As soon as I reached the gates of Trinity Pines, I had to choose either to drive through Livingston and down Highway 59 or to head west to Huntsville and hit I-45, often called the Gulf Freeway. Each choice is probably about the same distance. Every other time to and from Trinity Pines, I had driven Highway 59. That morning, I decided to take the Gulf Freeway. I was relieved that we had been able to leave early. It was only a few minutes after 11 so I could get back to the church by two. The senior minister had led a group to the Holy Land and left me responsible for our midweek service at South Park Church. He had also asked me to preach for the next two Sundays. That night was a prayer meeting, which required little preparation, but I needed to work on my sermon for the following Sunday morning. Before I left Alvin, I had written the draft for the first sermon entitled, I Believe in a Great God. As I drove, I planned to glance over the sermon and evaluate what I had written so far. Many times since, I have thought about my decision to take the Gulf Freeway. It's amazing how we pay no attention to simple decisions at the time they're made. Yet I would remind myself that even the smallest decisions often hold significant consequences. This was one of those choices. I pulled out of Trinity Pines, turned right, and headed down Texas 19. That would take me to Huntsville and intersect with I-45 leading to Houston. I didn't have to drive far before I reached Lake Livingston, a man-made lake created by damming the Trinity River. What was once a riverbed is now a large, beautiful lake. Spanning Lake Livingston is a two-lane highway 
whose roadbed has been built up above the level of the lake. The road has no shoulders, making it extremely narrow. I would have to drive across a long expanse of water on that narrow road until I reached the other side. I had no premonitions about the trip, although I was aware of the road's lack of shoulders. At the end of the highway across the lake is the original bridge over the Trinity River. Immediately after the bridge, the road rises sharply, climbing the bluff above the Trinity's river bed. This sharp upturn makes visibility a problem for drivers in both directions. This was my first time to see the bridge, and it looked curiously out of place. I have no idea of the span, but the bridge is quite long. It's an old bridge with a massive, rusty steel superstructure. Other than the immediate road ahead, I could see little, and I certainly didn't glimpse any other traffic. It was a dangerous bridge, as I would learn later. Several accidents had occurred on it. Although no longer used, the bridge is still there. The state built another one beside it. I drove about fifty miles an hour because it was, for me, uncharted territory. I braced my shoulders against the chill inside the car. The wind made the morning seem even colder than it was. The steady rain had turned into a cloudburst. I would be happy to finally reach Alvin again. About 11.45 a.m., just before I cleared the east end of the bridge, an 18-wheeler driven by an inmate, a trustee of the Texas Department of Corrections, weaved across the center line and hit my car head-on. The truck sandwiched my small car between the bridge railing and the driver's side of the truck. All those wheels went right over the top of my car and smashed it. I remember parts of the accident, but most of my information came from the accident report and people at the scene. From the description I received from witnesses, the truck then veered off to the other side of the narrow bridge and sideswiped two other cars. They were in front of the truck and had already passed me going in the opposite direction. The police record says that the truck was driving fast, at least 60 miles an hour, when it struck my car. The inexperienced driver finally brought the truck to a stop almost at the end of the bridge. A young Vietnamese man was in one vehicle that was hit, and an elderly Caucasian man was in the other. Although shaken up, both drivers suffered only minor cuts and bruises. They refused help, so the paramedics transported neither man to the hospital. Because of the truck's speed, the accident report states that the impact was about 110 miles an hour. That is, the truck struck me while going 60 miles an hour, and I was carefully cruising along at 50. The inmate received a citation for failure to control his vehicle and speeding. Information later came out that the inmate wasn't licensed to drive the truck. At the prison, supervisors had asked for volunteers to drive their truck to pick up food items and bring them back. Because he was the only volunteer, they let him drive their supply truck. Two guards followed close behind in another state-owned pickup. After the accident, the truck driver didn't have a scratch on him. The prison truck received little damage. However, the heavy vehicle had crushed my Ford and pushed it from the narrow road. Only the bridge railing stopped my car from going into the lake. According to those who were on the scene, the guards called for medical backup from the prison, and they arrived a few minutes later. Someone examined me, found no pulse, and declared I had been killed instantly. I have no recollection of the impact or anything that happened afterwards. In one powerful, overwhelming second, I died. Chapter 2. My Time in Heaven Genesis 28:17. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Genesis 28:17. When I died, I didn't flow through a long, dark tunnel. I had no sense of fading away or of coming back. I never felt my body being transported into the light. I heard no voices calling to me or anything else. Simultaneous 
with my last recollection of seeing the bridge and the rain, a light enveloped me, with a brilliance beyond earthly comprehension or description, only that. In the next moment of awareness, I was standing in heaven. Joy pulsated through me as I looked around, and at that moment I became aware of a large crowd of people. They stood in front of a brilliant, ornate gate. I have no idea how far away they were. Such things as distance didn't matter. As the crowd rushed toward me, I didn't see Jesus, but I did see people I had known. As they surged around me, I knew instantly that all of them had died during my lifetime. Their presence seemed absolutely natural. They rushed toward me, and every person was smiling, shouting, and praising God. Although no one said so intuitively, I knew that they were my celestial welcoming committee. It was as if they had all gathered just outside of heaven's gate, waiting for me. The first person I recognized was Joe Colbeth, my grandfather. He looked exactly as I remembered him with his shock of white hair and what I call a big banana nose. He stopped momentarily and stood in front of me. A grin covered his face. I may have called his name, but I'm not sure. Donnie? That's what my grandfather always called me. His eyes lit up, and he held out his arms as he took the last step toward me. He embraced me, holding me tightly. He was once again the robust, strong grandfather I had remembered as a child. I had been with him when he suffered a heart attack at home, and had ridden with him in the ambulance. I had been standing just outside the emergency room at the hospital when the doctor walked out and faced me. He shook his head and said softly, We did everything we could. My grandfather released me. As I stared into his face, an ecstatic bliss overwhelmed me. I didn't think about his heart attack or his death because I couldn't get past the joy of our reunion. How either of us reached heaven seemed irrelevant. I have no idea why my grandfather was the first person I saw. Perhaps it was something to do with my being there when he died. He wasn't one of the great spiritual guides of my life, although he certainly influenced me positively in that way. After being hugged by my grandfather, I don't remember who was second or third, the crowd surrounded me. Some hugged me and a few kissed my cheek, while others pumped my hand. Never have I felt more loved. One person in that greeting committee was Mike Wood, my childhood friend. Mike was special because he invited me to Sunday school and was influential in my becoming a Christian. Mike was the most devoted young Christian I knew. He was a popular kid and had lettered four years in football, basketball, and track and field. An amazing feat. He also became a hero to me because he lived the Christian lifestyle he often talked about. After high school, Mike received a full scholarship to Louisiana State University. When he was 19, Mike was killed in a car wreck. It broke my heart when I heard about his death, and it took me a long time to get over it. His death was the biggest shock and most painful experience I had up to that time in my life. When I attended his funeral, I wondered if I would ever stop crying. I couldn't understand why God had taken such a dedicated disciple. Through the years since, I have never been able to forget the pain and sense of loss. Not that I thought about him all the time, but when I did, sadness came over me. Now I saw Mike in heaven. As he slipped his arm around my shoulder, my pain and grief vanished. Never had I seen Mike smile so brightly. I still didn't know why, but the joyousness of the place wiped away any questions. Everything felt blissful, perfect. More and more people reached for me and called me by name. I felt overwhelmed by the number of people who had come to welcome me to heaven. There were so many of them, and I had never imagined anyone being as happy as they all were. Their faces radiated a serenity I had never seen on earth. All were full of life and expressed radiant joy. Time had no meaning. However, for clarity, I relate this experience in terms that refer to time. 
I saw my great-grandfather, heard his voice, and felt his embrace as he told me how excited he was that I had come to join them. I saw Barry Wilson, who had been my classmate in high school but later drowned in a lake. Barry hugged me, and his smile radiated a happiness I didn't know was possible. He and everyone that followed praised God and told me how excited they were to see me and to welcome me to heaven and to the fellowship they enjoyed. Just then I spotted two teachers who had loved me and often talked to me about Jesus Christ. As I walked among them, I became aware of the wide variety of ages, old and young, and every age in between. Many of them had not known each other on earth, but each had influenced my life in some way. Even though they hadn't met on earth, they seemed to know each other now. As I try to explain this, my words seem weak and hardly adequate, because I have to use earthly terms to refer to unimaginable joy, excitement, warmth, and total happiness. Everyone continually embraced me, touched me, spoke to me, laughed, and praised God. This seemed to go on for a long time, but I didn't tire of it. My father is one of eleven children. Some of his brothers and sisters had as many as thirteen children. When I was a kid, our family reunions were so huge, we rented an entire city park in Monticello, Arkansas. We pipers are affectionate, with a lot of hugging and kissing whenever we come together. None of those earthly family reunions, however, prepared me for the sublime gathering of saints I experienced at the gates of heaven. Those who had gathered at Monticello were some of the same people waiting for me at the gates of heaven. Heaven was many things, but without a doubt, it was the greatest family reunion of all. Everything I experienced was like a first-class buffet for the senses. I have never felt such powerful embraces or feasted my eyes on such beauty. Heaven's light and texture defy earthly eyes or explanation. Warm, radiant light engulfed me. As I looked around, I could hardly grasp the vivid, dazzling colors. Every hue and tone surpassed anything I had ever seen. With all the heightened awareness of my senses, I felt as if I had never seen, heard, or felt anything so real before. I don't recall that I tasted anything, yet I knew that if I had, that too would have been more glorious than anything I had eaten or drunk on earth. The best way I can explain it is to say I felt as if I were in another dimension. Never, even in my happiest moments, had I ever felt so fully alive. I stood speechless in front of the crowds of loved ones, still trying to take in everything. Over and over, I heard how overjoyed they were to see me and how excited they were to have me among them. I'm not sure if they actually said the words or not, but I knew that they had been waiting and expecting me. Yet I also knew that in heaven there is no sense of time passing. I gazed at all the faces again, and I realized that they had all contributed to my becoming a Christian, or had encouraged me in my growth as a believer. Each one had affected me positively. Each one had spiritually impacted me in some way and helped make me a better disciple. I knew, again one of those things I knew without being aware of how I had absorbed that information, that because of their influence I was able to be present with them in heaven. We didn't talk about what they had done for me. Our conversation centered on the joy of my being there and how happy they were to see me. Still overwhelmed, I didn't know how to respond to their welcoming words. I'm happy to be with you, I said even though those words couldn't express the utter joy of being surrounded and embraced by all those people I loved. I wasn't conscious of anything I left behind and felt no regrets about leaving family or possessions. It was as if God had removed anything negative or worrisome from my consciousness, and I could only rejoice 
at being together with these wonderful people. They looked exactly as I once knew them, although they were more radiant and joyful than they had ever been on earth. My great-grandmother, Hattie Mann, was Native American. As a child, I saw her only after she had developed osteoporosis. Her head and shoulders were bent forward, giving her a, a humped appearance. I especially remember her extremely wrinkled face. The other thing that stands out in my memory is that she had false teeth, which she didn't wear often. Yet when she smiled at me in heaven, her teeth sparkled. I knew they were her own, and when she smiled, it was the most beautiful smile I had ever seen. Then I noticed something else. She wasn't slumped over. She stood strong and upright, and the wrinkles had been erased from her face. I have no idea what age she was, and I didn't even think about it. As I stared at her beaming face, I sensed that age has no meaning in heaven. Age expresses time passing, and there is no time there. All of the people I encountered were the same age they had been the last time I had seen them, except that all the ravages of living on earth had vanished. Even though some of their features may not have been considered attractive on earth, in heaven every feature was perfect, beautiful, and wonderful to gaze at. Even now, years later, I can sometimes close my eyes and see those perfect countenances and smiles that surprise me with the most human warmth and friendliness I've ever witnessed. Just being with them was a holy moment and remains a treasured hope. When I first stood in heaven, they were still in front of me and came rushing toward me. They embraced me, and no matter which direction I looked, I saw someone I had loved and who had loved me. They surrounded me, moving around so that everyone had a chance to welcome me to heaven. I felt loved more love than ever before in my life. They didn't say they loved me. I don't remember what words they spoke. When they gazed at me, I knew what the Bible means by perfect love. It emanated from every person who surrounded me. I stared at them, and as I did, I felt as if I absorbed their love for me. At some point, I looked around, and the sight overwhelmed me. Everything was brilliantly intense. Coming out from the gate a short distance ahead was a brilliance that was brighter than the light that surrounded us, utterly luminous. As soon as I stopped gazing at the people's faces, I realized that everything around me glowed with a dazzling intensity. In trying to describe the scene, words are totally inadequate, because human words can't express the feeling of awe and wonder at what I beheld. Everything I saw glowed with intense brightness. The best I can describe it is that we began to move toward the light. No one said it was time to do so, yet we all started forward at the same time. As I stared ahead, everything seemed to grow taller, like a gentle hill that kept going upward and never stopped. I had expected to see some darkness behind the gate, but as far ahead as I could see, there was absolutely nothing but intense, radiant light. By contrast, the powerful light I encountered when I met my friends and loved ones paled into darkness as the radiance and iridescence in front of me increased. It was as if each step I took intensified the glowing luminosity. I didn't know how it could get more dazzling, but it did. It would be like cracking open the door of a dark room and walking into the brightness of the noonday sun. As the door swings open, the full rays of the sun burst forth, and we're momentarily blinded. I wasn't blinded, but I was amazed that the luster and intensity continually increased. Strange as it seems, as brilliant as everything was, each time I stepped forward the splendor increased. The further I walked, the brighter the light. The light engulfed me, and I had the sense that I was being ushered into the presence of God. 
Although our earthly eyes must gradually adjust to light or darkness, my heavenly eyes saw with absolute ease in heaven each of our senses is immeasurably heightened to take it all in. And what a sensory celebration! A holy awe came over me as I stepped forward. I had no idea what lay ahead, but I sensed that with each step I took it would grow more wondrous. Then I heard the music. Chapter 3 Heavenly Music Revelation 5.11 Then I looked again, and I heard the singing of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and the living beings and the elders. Revelation 5.11 As a young boy, I spent a lot of time out in the country and woods. When walking through the waist-high dried grass, I often surprised a covey of birds and flushed them out of their nest on the ground. A whooshing sound accompanied their wings as they flew away. My most vivid memory of heaven is what I heard. I can only describe it as a holy swoosh of wings. But I'd have to magnify that thousands of times to explain the effect of the sound in heaven. It was the most beautiful and pleasant sound I've ever heard, and it didn't stop. It was like a song that goes on forever. I felt awestruck, wanting only to listen. I didn't just hear music. It seemed as if I were part of the music, and it played in and through my body. I stood still, yet I felt embraced by the sounds. As aware as I became of the joyous sounds and melodies that fill the air, I wasn't distracted. I felt as if the heavenly concert permeated every part of my being, and at the same time I focused on everything else around me. I never saw anything that produced the sound. I had the sense that whatever made the heavenly music was just above me, but I didn't look up. I'm not sure why. Perhaps it was because I was so enamored with the people around me, or maybe it was because my senses were so engaged that I feasted on everything at the same time. I asked no questions and never wondered about anything. Everything was perfect. I sensed that I knew everything and had no questions to ask. Myriads of sounds so filled my mind and heart that it's difficult to explain them. The most amazing one, however, was the angel's wings. I didn't see them, but the sound was a beautiful, holy melody with a cadence that seemed never to stop. The swishing resounded as if it was a form of never-ending praise. As I listened, I simply knew what it was. A second sound remains, even today, the single most vivid memory I have of my entire heavenly experience. I call it music, but it differed from anything I had ever heard or expect to hear on earth. The melodies of praise filled the atmosphere. The non-stop intensity and endless variety overwhelmed me. The praise was unending. But the most remarkable thing to me was that the hundreds of songs were being sung at the same time, all of them worshiping God. As I approached the large, magnificent gate, I heard them from every direction and realized that each voice praised God. I write voice, but it was more than that. Some sounded instrumental, but I wasn't sure, and I wasn't concerned. Praise was everywhere, and all of it was musical, yet comprised of melodies and tones I'd never experienced before. Hallelujah! Praise! Glory to God! Praise to the King! Such words rang out in the midst of all the music. I don't know if angels were singing them, or if they came from humans. I felt so awestruck and caught up in the heavenly mood that I didn't look around. My heart filled with the deepest joy I've ever experienced. I wasn't a participant in the worship, yet I felt as if my heart rang out with the same kind of joy and exuberance. 
If we played three CDs of praise at the same time, we'd have a cacophony of noise that would drive us crazy. This was totally different. Every sound blended, and each voice or instrument enhanced the others. As strange as it may seem, I could clearly distinguish each song. It sounded as if each hymn of praise was meant for me to hear as I moved inside the gates. Many of the old hymns and choruses I had sung at various times in my life were part of the music, along with hundreds of songs I had never heard before. Hymns of praise, modern-sounding choruses, and ancient chants filled my ears and brought not only a deep peace but the greatest feeling of joy. I've ever experienced. As I stood before the gate, I didn't think of it, but later I realized that I didn't hear such songs as the old rugged cross or the nail scarred hand. None of the hymns that filled the air were about Jesus' sacrifice or death. I heard no sad songs, and instinctively knew that there are no sad songs in heaven. Why would there be? All were praises about Christ's reign as King of Kings, and our joyful worship for all He has done for us, and how wonderful He is. The celestial tune surpassed any I had ever heard. I couldn't calculate the number of songs, perhaps thousands, offered up simultaneously, and yet there was no chaos. Because I had the capacity to hear each one and discern the lyrics and melody, I marvelled at the glorious music. Though not possessed of a great singing voice in life, I knew that if I sang, my voice would be in perfect pitch and would sound as melodious and harmonious as the thousands of other voices and instruments that filled my ears. Even now, back on earth. Sometimes I still hear faint echoes of that music. When I am especially tired and lie in bed with my eyes closed, occasionally I drift off to sleep with the sounds of heaven filling my heart and mind. No matter how difficult a day I've had, peace immediately fills every part of my being. I still have flashbacks. Although they're different from what we normally refer to as flashbacks, mine are more flashbacks of the sounds than the sights. As I have pondered the meaning of the memory of the music, it seems curious. I would have expected the most memorable experience to be something I had seen or the physical embrace of a loved one. Yet above everything else, I cherish those sounds. And at times I think, I can't wait to hear them again, in person. It's what I look forward to. I want to see everybody, but I know I'll be with them forever. I want to experience everything heaven has to offer. But most of all, I want to hear those never-ending songs again. Obviously, I. Can't really know how God feels, but I find joy and comfort in thinking that He must be pleased and blessed by the continuous sounds of praise. In those moments, and they held no sense of time for me. Others touched me, and their warm embraces were absolutely real. I saw colors. I would never have believed existed. I never ever felt more alive than I did then. I was home. I was where I belonged. I wanted to be there more than I had ever wanted to be anywhere on earth. Time had slipped away, and I was simply present in heaven. All worries, anxieties, and concerns. Vanished. I had no needs, and I felt perfect. I get frustrated describing what heaven was like.
because I can't begin to put into words what it looked like, sounded like, and felt like it was perfect. And I knew I had no needs and never would again. I didn't even think of earth or those left behind. I did not see God, although I knew God was there. I never saw any kind of image or luminous glow to indicate his divine presence. I've heard people talk about going inside and coming back out the gate. That didn't happen to me. I only saw a bright iridescence. I peered through the gate, yearning to see what lay beyond. It wasn't an anxious yearning, but a peaceful openness to experience all the grace and joy of heaven. The only way I've made sense out of that part of the experience is to think that if I had actually seen God, I would never have wanted to return. My feeling has been that once we're actually in God's presence, we will never return to earth again because it will be empty and meaningless by comparison. For me, just to reach the gates was amazing. It was a foretaste of joy divine. My words are too feeble to describe what took place. As a pastor, I have often stood at the foot of many caskets and done many funerals and said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord to those who love him and know him. I believed those words before. I believe them even more now. After a time, I'm resorting to human terms again, we started moving together right up to the gate. No one said it, but I simply knew God had sent all those people to escort me inside the portals of heaven. Looming just over the heads of my reception committee stood an awesome gate interrupting a wall that faded out of sight in both directions. It struck me that the actual entrance was small in comparison to the massive gate itself. I stared, but I couldn't see the end of the walls in either direction. As I gazed upward, I couldn't see the top either. One thing did surprise me. On earth, whenever I thought of heaven, I anticipated that one day I would see a gate made of pearls, because the Bible refers to the gates of pearl. The gate wasn't made of pearls, but was pearlescent. Perhaps iridescent may be more descriptive. To me, it looked as if someone had spread pearl icing on a cake. The gate glowed and shimmered. I paused and stared at the glorious hues and shimmering shades. The luminescence dazzled me, and I would have been content to stay at that spot. Yet I stepped forward, as if being escorted into God's presence. I paused just outside the gate, and I could see inside. It was like a city with paved streets. To my amazement, they had been constructed of literal gold. If you could imagine a street paved with gold bricks, that's as close as I can come to describing what lay inside the gate. Everything I saw was bright, the brightest colors my eyes have ever beheld, so powerful that no earthly human could take in this brilliance. In the midst of that powerful scene, I continued to step closer to the gate and assumed that I would go inside. My friends and relatives were all in front of me, calling, urging, inviting me to follow. Then the scene changed. I can explain it only by saying that instead of their being in front of me, they were beside me. I felt that they wanted to walk beside me as I passed through the iridescent gate. Sometimes people have asked, well, how did you move? Did you walk? Did you float? I don't know. I just moved along with a welcoming crowd. As we came closer to the gate, the music increased and became even more vivid. It would be like walking up to a glorious event after hearing the faint sounds and seeing everything from a distance. The closer we got, the more intense, alive, and vivid everything became. Just as I reached the gate, my senses were even more heightened, and I felt deliriously happy. I paused. I'm not sure why. Just outside the gate, 
I was thrilled at the prospect and wanted to go inside. I knew everything would be even more thrilling than I experienced so far. At that very moment, I was about to realize the yearning of every human heart. I was in heaven and ready to go in through the pearlescent gate. During that momentary pause, something else changed. Instead of just hearing the music and the thousands of voices praising God, I became part of the choir. I was one of them, and they had absorbed me into their midst. I had arrived at a place I had wanted to visit for a long time. I'd lingered to gaze before I continued forward. Then, just as suddenly as I had arrived at the gates of heaven, I left them. Chapter 4 From Heaven to Earth Psalm 23, 4 Even when I walk through the dark valley of death, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. Psalm 23, 4 the EMTs pronounced me dead as soon as they arrived at the scene. They stated that I died instantly. According to the report, the collision occurred at 11.45 a.m. The EMTs became so busy working on the others involved that it was about 1.15 p.m. before they were ready to move me. They checked for a pulse once again. I was still dead. The state law said that they had to pronounce me dead officially before they could remove my body from the scene of the accident. Unless they declared me dead, an ambulance would have to transport my body to a hospital. That county didn't have a coroner, but I later learned that a justice of the peace could declare me dead, and then they could remove my body. Ambulances had come from the prison, the county, and Huntsville. Except for one, all of them left without taking back any patients. The last one was preparing to leave. From information I pieced together, someone had arranged for an unmarked vehicle to take my body to a mortuary. They had called for the jaws of life to get me out of the smashed car. Because I was dead, there seemed to be no need for speed. Their concern focused on clearing the bridge for traffic to flow again. When the truck came in at an angle and went right over the top of me, the truck smashed the car ceiling, and the dashboard came down across my legs, crushing my right leg. My left leg was shattered in two places between the car seat and the dashboard. My left arm went over the top of my head, was dislocated, and swung backward over the seat. It was still attached, barely. The left arm had been lying on the driver's side door because I had been driving with my right hand. As I would learn later, the major bones were now missing, so my lower left arm was just a piece of flesh that held the hand to the rest of the arm. It was the same with my left leg. There was some tissue just above my knee that still fed blood to the calf and foot below. Four and a half inches of femur were missing and never found. The doctors have no medical explanation why I didn't lose all the blood in my body. Glass and blood had sprayed everywhere. I had all kinds of small holes in my face from embedded glass. The steering wheel had pounded into my chest. Blood seeped out of my eyes, ears, and nose. Just from seeing the results of the crash, the EMTs knew that I had to have sustained massive head injuries, and that my insides were completely rearranged. When he first felt no pulse, one of the EMTs covered me with a waterproof tarp that also blocked off the top of the car. They made no attempt to move me or to try to get me out immediately. They couldn't have anyway, because it would have been impossible for them to drag or lift me out of the vehicle without the jaws of life. One thing that sped help to the scene was that the two prison guards in the pickup truck immediately called for emergency assistance from the prison. Otherwise, we would have been too far away for any emergency vehicle to get to us quickly. 
They examined the drivers of the other two cars. Both of them were uninjured and refused medical attention. The prisoner who drove the truck sustained no injuries. As soon as the EMTs determined he was all right, they transported him back to the prison. Police halted all traffic on the bridge and waited for the ambulance to arrive. While they waited, traffic backed up for miles in both directions, especially the direction I had come from. It was only a narrow two-lane bridge, not wide enough for a car to turn around. Even if the waiting traffic could have turned around, they would have had to drive an extra 40 or 50 miles around the lake to reach another road leading to their destination. From the backed-up traffic, Dick and Anita Onorecker walked at least half a mile to the scene of the accident. Dick and Anita had started a church in Klein, which is north of Houston. Both had spoken at the conference I'd just attended. I'm not positive we actually met at Trinity Pines, although we may have. For years I had heard of Dick Onorecker, but that conference was the first time I had ever seen him. On Wednesday morning, the honor wreckers left Trinity Pines a few minutes before I did. By Houston standards, that January morning was extremely cold. As they sped along, Anita said, I'm really chilled. Could we stop for coffee? I think that would warm me up. Dick spotted a Bates shop right on Lake Livingston, so they pulled over. Apparently, while they were buying coffee, I drove past them. Many times afterward, Dick would bury his face in his hands and say, You know, that could easily have been us. It should have been us. But because we stopped and you drove past us, you got hit. Before the honor wreckers reached the bridge, the accident had occurred and the traffic had started to back up. People got out of their cars and milled around, asking questions and sharing their limited information. After Dick and Anita got out of their car, they asked fellow drivers, What's going on up there? The word had passed down that there had been a serious auto accident. A truck crashed into a car was about all anyone knew. Dick and Anita stood around for a few minutes, but nothing happened, and more cars lined up behind them. Sometime between 12.30 and 12.45, they decided to walk to the accident site. And when they saw a police officer, Dick said, I'm a minister. Is there anybody here I can help? Is there anyone I can pray for? The police officer shook his head. The people in those two cars, he said and pointed, are shaken up a little bit, but they're fine. Talk to them if you'd like. What about the other vehicle, the one with the tarp over it? The man in the red car is deceased. While Dick talked to the officer, Anita went over to the other vehicles. She gave her barely touched coffee to the old man. Dick would later tell it this way. God spoke to me and said, You need to pray for the man in the red car. Dick was an outstanding Baptist preacher. Praying for a dead man certainly ran counter to his theology. I can't do that, he thought. How can I go over there and pray the man is dead? The rain had become a light drizzle, but Dick was oblivious to his surroundings. Dick stared at the officer, knowing that what he would say wouldn't make sense. Yet God spoke to him so clearly that he had no doubt about what he was to do. God told him to pray for a dead man. As bizarre as that seemed to him, Dick also had no doubt that the Holy Spirit was prompting him to act. I'd like to pray for the man in the red car, Dick finally said to the officer. Like I said, he's dead. I know this sounds strange, but I want to pray for him anyway. The officer stared at him for a long time before he finally said, Well, you know, if that's what you want to do, go ahead. But I've got to tell you, it's an awful sight. He's dead, and it's really a mess under the tarp. Blood and glass are everywhere, and the body's all mangled. Dick, then in his forties, said, I was a medic in Vietnam, so the idea of blood doesn't bother me. I have to warn you, the man stopped, shrugged, and said, Do what you want, but I'll tell you that you haven't seen anybody this bad. Thanks, said Dick. I walked to the tarp-covered car. 
From the pictures of that smashed down car, it's almost impossible to believe, but somehow Dick actually crawled into the trunk of my fort. It had been a hatchback, but that part of the car had been severed. I was still covered by the tarp, which he didn't remove, so it was extremely dark inside the car. Dick crept in behind me, leaned over the back seat, and put his hand on my right shoulder. He began praying for me. As he said later, I felt compelled to pray. I didn't know who the man was or whether he was a believer. I only knew that God told me I had to pray for him. As Dick prayed, he became quite emotional and broke down and cried several times. Then he sang. Dick had an excellent voice and often sang publicly. He paused several times to sing a hymn and then went back to prayer. Not only did Dick believe God had called him to pray for me, but he prayed quite specifically that I would be delivered from unseen injuries, meaning brain and internal injuries. This sounds strange, because Dick knew I was dead. Not only had the police officer told him, but he had also checked for a pulse. He had no idea why he prayed as he did, except God told him to. He didn't pray for the injuries he could see, only for the healing of internal damage. He said he prayed the most passionate, fervent, emotional prayer of his life. As I would later learn, Dick was a highly emotional man anyway. Then he began to sing again. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. The only thing I personally know for certain about that entire event is that as he sang the blessed old hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, I began to sing with him. In that first moment of consciousness, I was aware of two things. First, I was singing, a different kind of singing than the tones of heaven. I heard my own voice and then became aware of someone else singing. The second thing I was aware of was that someone clutched my hand. It was a strong, powerful touch, and the first physical sensation I experienced with my return to earthly life. More than a year would lapse before I understood the significance of that hand clasping mine. Chapter 5. Earth to Hospital Hebrews 11.16 But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a heavenly city for them. Hebrews 11.16 I'm not certain what the world record is for exiting a wrecked car, but Dick Onorecker must have surely broken it that Wednesday afternoon. When a dead man began to sing with him, Dick scrambled out of the smashed car and raced over to the nearest EMT. The man's alive! He's not dead! He's alive! Who would have believed him? A preacher had started to pray for a man who had been dead for an hour and a half, then he dashed across the road, shouting, The man has come back to life. The EMT stared. He's alive! The dead man started singing with me! The words didn't make sense as Dick thought of them later, but he could only keep yelling, He's singing! He's alive! Oh, really? A paramedic asked. I'm serious. This man's alive! We're medical professionals. We know a dead guy when we see him. That guy is dead. I'm telling you, the man just sang with me. He's alive. The justice of the peace is on his way here. 
He explained that although they knew I was dead, they couldn't move my body until someone in authority actually declared me dead. But I could tell you this much, he is dead. The man turned away from Dick and refused to go over to the car. Several ambulances had already arrived and departed. Dick walked up in front of the remaining ambulance and said to the driver, That man is alive. Go look at him. The EMT began to act as if he handled feeble-minded people all the time. Please, we know our business. The man is... Listen to me. I'm going to lie on this bridge, and if you don't come over here, you're going to have to run over me. He's dead. Then humor me. Just feel his pulse, Dick pleaded. Okay, we'll check on him for you, the man said, mumbling under his breath. He walked over to the car, raised the tarp, reached inside, and found my right arm. He felt my pulse. Everyone leapt into action. They began trying to figure out how to get me out. They could have taken me out on one side, but it would have been without my left leg. There was no clearance from the dashboard between my left leg and the seat, so they would have had to amputate. My leg was barely hanging on to my body anyway. I'm not sure they could have gotten my right leg out either. The point is that even though they could have gotten me out without the equipment, they would have left some of me in the car. They decided to wait on the proper equipment. They got on the phone and ordered the Jaws of Life to hurry from Huntsville, which was at least 30 miles away. I'm sure they did whatever they could for me, but I remember nothing. I remained vaguely conscious of people moving around me, touching me, and talking. I heard voices, but I couldn't make sense of anything they said. Dick refused to leave me. He got back inside the car, and while he was able to kneel behind me, he continued to pray until the jaws of life arrived. Only after they lifted me into the ambulance did he leave my side. When the EMTs lifted me out of the car, I remember that it involved a number of men, at least six or seven. As they moved me, I heard them talking about my leg. One of them said something about being careful so that my left leg didn't come off. My system was in shock, so I felt no pain, not then, anyway. That came later. They laid me on the gurney and started to roll me toward the ambulance. A light mist sprayed my face, and I saw nothing except the superstructure of the bridge above me. I was unable to move my head. I heard people walking around and glass crunching under their feet. They kept their voices low, so I had trouble following what they were saying. I remember thinking, something terrible has happened here, and I think it's happened to me. Even when I knew they were moving me into the ambulance, I felt weightless. I don't remember anything about the ambulance ride, but I, later I learned that we went to two hospitals, both of which were little more than rural clinics. There's nothing we can do for him, I heard one doctor say as he examined me. He's not going to make it. You may have gotten him out of the car alive, but it won't do any good. He's past hope. They put me back inside the ambulance and drove away. I vaguely remember when they pulled up at the Huntsville Hospital, a fairly large regional medical center. It was about 2.30 p.m. By then the authorities had notified my wife, Eva. She teaches school, and someone had called the school to tell her about the accident. Someone else called the schools where our three children attended. Church members picked up our children and took them to their homes to keep them until they heard from Eva. No one knew then I had died hours earlier. For the first hours after I returned to Earth, they had no idea how extensive my injuries were. Even though they knew nothing specific, church people began to pray for my recovery. They called others to join with them. Eva found out I had died from Dick Onorecker almost two weeks after the accident on one of Dick's visits to see me in the hospital. It was only then that she understood just how bad it had been. Also by that time, our insurance agent, Ann Dillman, 
a member of South Park, had brought pictures of the wreckage after it had been moved from the bridge. Eva says it was quite some time before she really understood how bad it was. She says she probably didn't pay any attention to the bad news on purpose because she was trying to focus on immediate matters at hand. Our children, other family members, and friends then began to piece together just how horrendous the accident was and how close I came to not surviving it. One of the EMTs said, We're here now. You're going to be all right. I was aware of being wheeled into the hospital. I stared uncomprehendingly at the large number of people who pulled back to make space and watched the gurney roll past them. Faces stared down at me. Our eyes met for a split second as the gurney kept moving. They took me into a room where a doctor was waiting for me. It's strange, but the only thing I recall about the doctor who examined me was that he was bald. He spent quite a while checking me over. Mr. Piper, we're going to do everything we can to save you, he must have said three times. You're hurt bad, seriously hurt, but we'll do all we can. Despite his words, I later learned that he didn't expect me to survive. But he did everything he could to give me hope and urge me to fight to stay alive. Several people moved around me. They were obviously trying to save my life, but I still felt no pain. It was like living in some kind of twilight state where I could feel nothing and remained only vaguely aware of what went on around me. We have your wife on the phone, someone said. They patched her through on the telephone to the emergency room. A nurse laid the phone beside my ear. I remember talking to Eva, but I can't recall one word either of us said. Eva remembers the entire conversation. According to her, the only thing I said was, I'm so sorry this happened. It's okay, Don. It's not your fault. Over and over I kept saying, I'm so sorry. I just wanted to come home. Please bring me home. In some kind of childlike way, I suppose, I felt that if I couldn't be in my heavenly home, I wanted to be back in my earthly one. <laughs> 